So when you're creating your policy for school safety, you should be asking several questions. And it's not about having a particular answer to any of these questions. It's about having the discussion both within your school and in the broader community to answer these. So first of all, who should have access to data? Is it everyone in the school community? Is it just the educators serving students? Is it just your threat assessment committee? Is it just school principals? These are questions that need to be discussed before you adopt a particular technology or before you collect new data because it's incredibly important that only the people who need data to do their jobs have access to that data. And who those people are, are going to vary from community to community. The next question is, how long data should be kept? No one wants to create a permanent record of a child that will follow them around their whole life, especially if there's a mistake or a flaw in the data. And so asking questions about when data will be deleted or how long you will keep a particular type of record, like a record about a school fight that may no longer be relevant is incredibly important as you collect new data for your school safety initiative. For students who are identified as a threat or at risk of self-harm, it's important to discuss whether schools will allow them to access the information used to make that determination. This, first of all, is just a principle of fairness and a principle that underlies the vast majority of privacy laws in the United States. So FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, actually requires that schools turn over information to parents that is part of a student's education record. Generally speaking, if you identify a student as a threat or at risk of self-harm and are taking school action against that student, that becomes part of their education record. So you may legally have to turn over that information, but there's also a question of just transparency. How do you build trust with your communities that the people who are flagged as a threat are actually a threat or the people at risk of self-harm are actually at risk of self-harm? For example, I've heard several districts tell me about students who in writing their college essays wrote about struggles that they went through earlier in their life that triggered various self-harm keywords. And fortunately, in the best districts, they called the people who knew the student the best. They talked to the teacher, to the principal, and they asked, is this student likely to actually be at risk of self-harm? And therefore, should we call law enforcement? Should we call the student themselves, their parent? And they were able to make a nuanced decision about what to do there. And as it turned out, they called the student. She's like, yep, I'm writing my college essay. This is the context. And it's really important that schools consider that because if you suddenly have law enforcement knocking down the door, you don't know what that causes in that house and what the repercussions will be for your school, both on a legal side, but also in, again, violating that trust with your community. Another question to consider is whether students or parents can opt out of the system. So this often comes up in the context of when you have parents who are volunteers for the school or when you adopt a facial recognition system. Inevitably, at least a few people are going to ask if they can opt out of the system. Make sure that you think about the possibility of allowing opt-outs before, ideally, or now, <laughs> uh, you adopt those systems. Because sometimes you don't need everybody in the system. Sometimes not having everybody would break the system because it would be an unknown face, for example, in a facial recognition system. Or you could have a technology that you're picking between that if you allow for opt-outs, one would break the system and one wouldn't. So if you can decide on these policies prior to adopting technologies, it can help you decide which tool or which non-technological tool is best for you. It's very important that in all of this, you think about digital equity. Students who are lower socioeconomic status 
may not have access to the internet at home, may not have access to a device at home. And so the problem that you run into is that they are using their school provided device for everything they do online or they're using their school provided wireless network for everything they do online. And students who are middle class or upper class have devices at home. They have their parents' computer, maybe their own tablet, maybe their own laptop, and they're not dependent on the school to access the internet and to access basic things like word processors or design software or other things. Inevitably, this means that because of your monitoring obligations under the Children's Internet Protection Act, that you are scanning the digital life of poorer students way more than you are scanning the digital life of richer students. And so you have to really carefully think about the implications of that. Is it fair to scan those devices when students are off campus? How detailed are you going to be in your monitoring? There's no specified standard of monitoring in the federal law, so it, it can be very, very broad or very, very specific. And that's gonna vary in choice by community, by the type of threats or common issues that you have. But again, come back to fairness. The mistakes that low socioeconomic students are going to make are gonna happen on the school device and the school network, while the mistakes that are made by middle and upper class students are not. And is it fair that the students over here are going to be punished for the same things that happen to students who have their own devices and their own internet when the only reason that you know about them is because they are dependent on the school for internet access. It's also really, really important to think about bias. So we know from tons and tons of research that we have a disproportionate suspension problem in this country where students with disabilities, where minority students are continually punished at a higher rate, regardless of all other factors, than students who are white or students who are abled. Which means that when you introduce new surveillance systems in the same way that digital equity plays a part, how surveillance systems collect data and then how that data is perceived by others is going to be implicating bias. So for example, an administrator gave me a wonderful illustration. It feels like school security cameras would be the same for everyone. But the person who is looking at school surveillance footage may have implicit bias, bias that they have no recognition or idea that they hold that could impact what they're seeing and how they act on it. For example, an administrator might assume that an African-American student reaching into the backpack of another student is stealing. Well, if they saw a white student reaching into a backpack, they assume that that student is just getting a candy bar or getting a book from their friend. And so it's really important, particularly because a lot of times school safety involves getting law enforcement involved, that people think carefully about how bias will play into their surveillance system and when and how they will be involving law enforcement in any of these decisions. Finally, when you're creating your policies, think about special cases. Think about the edge cases that every school is going to face. For example, students who are being abused, you want to make sure that parents don't know their cries for help online. You want to make sure that the information that you are collecting about a threat or self-harm doesn't actually cause the student to 
receive greater harm from an abusive family or some other home situation. And so making sure that you have policies to cover those types of edge cases is very, very important because every school is going to have a student facing that situation at some point. And so thinking in advance about how you deal with that, how you proactively share information with parents is incredibly important.